Um, I'm really delighted to have Jack Batrash with here with us here tonight, and um, he is on the East Coast. And we were just talking about now that uh, the travel restrictions have been lifted, you know, trying to get him to do a California leg uh, for a visit, perhaps in the fall. It'd be great to see him in person. Um, we did have Jack Batrash out. Uh, I think it, so. It was about two and a half years ago. We were just trying to fix the date. Uh, he did come to our, our school and uh, present with our teachers and give a talk to parents. Um, typically, if you come to find out more about Waldorf education and Golden Valley and being at a charter school, one of the first things you'll see when you enter our school campus is a book called Understanding Waldorf Education by Jack Petrash. And we have it there uh, on a little pedestal uh, as a recommendation for a great introduction to finding out more about Waldorf education and um, we just had a parent information meeting last night. We had um, 30 different families that were interested in enrolling still in the fall uh, at the River and Orchard School. And the week before we had one for Tahoe. Uh, and we give just a very brief, you know, uh, generalization about what Waldorf education is. And it, I was kind of plugging this talk at those events saying, you know, if you really want an in-depth picture um, Jack's really the person to talk to. And uh, I was just confirming because I can never quite believe it when he tells me that, you know, Jack Petrash is one of those rare individuals who um, has taught a class one grades one through eight. So he stayed with the same group of students and then looped down and did it a second time and then looped down and did it a third time and then looped down and did it a fourth time. So he's he's gone four times through uh, one through eight. And uh, we've actually at, at Golden Valley, we've been around for 22 years and we have three teachers that have done it uh, once, one through eight. <laughs> uh, and we have one of them that's now on their second, you know, second journey through, but um, quite a feat to have done it four times through. And Jack is also, um, a part of the Nova Institute, which works uh, both in mainstream education and connecting people with the ideals of, of Waldorf education and helps to sponsor some of his work um, in public education around the country. So he can tell us a little bit about that. And uh, since it's already quarter after, I'm gonna turn it over to Jack Petrash and just cue me later on. We, we are gonna allow for questions. And I believe the way we're gonna organize the questions is uh, to have you send them through the chat and uh, since I'm one of the co-hosts tonight, uh, I'll be able to read the questions um, to our guests and give Jack a chance to respond to those. Uh, and then we may have a visual aid at the end that I'll, I'll share as we're going through the talk. So welcome everyone, just to recap, if you've joined us, um, Caleb Buckley, the Executive Director at Golden Valley Charter Schools. Our guest tonight is world-renowned Waldorf educator and most experienced class teacher uh, there ever was uh, from the Washington Walder School in the nation's capital, coming to us live from one of the nearby suburbs uh, in the hot and humid summer, <laughs> Jack Petrash. So welcome. Thank you, Caleb. Thank you very much. And, um, and to all of you who have uh, linked into our Zoom talk to be here tonight, I thank you very much for, for joining this evening event. And I think about my visits to your schools, the schools in Folsom and the school in Truckee, and I remember them very fondly. In fact, I was mentioning to Caleb that uh, my wife and I happened to be at the Truckee school the day that they, their charter got approved. And I remember the joy in that room uh, from Bonnie River and from the parents to know that their school would become part of the Golden Valley Charter Group. And uh, so it's a connection that, um, that I'm very glad to have. Now, our topic tonight is how do we bring health to our children? And that's been so much on our minds um, the past year and a half with the pandemic. How do we keep our children healthy? How do we keep our families healthy? And I want to speak about how Waldorf education does that um, because I believe very strongly in, in Waldorf teaching. That's the one thing that my, my four years of being a Waldorf teacher has given me is tremendous confidence in this education and, uh, and its intention and its potential. And so I'd like to speak about that, but I'm gonna begin 
uh, to speak about this idea of health with a story. And it's a story that um, a Waldorf colleague uh, of mine told. And so it's not my story. It was hers, Anna Silva was giving a talk and she told the story and I wanted to relate it to you as, a, as an introduction. She said that she was in a car with five children. It was after school and she was taking them for, uh, to get food and they were going out for, for burgers. And they were all in the car and the children ranged in age, these five children from three year old three-year-old was sitting right behind Anna who was driving and an eight-year-old and two 10-year-olds and an 11-year-old. And so there was a lot of chatting going on in the car and she wanted to join in that conversation. So she asked the kids, she said, so what are you gonna get on top of your burger? And one of the 10-year-olds said, oh, I'm getting grilled onions. And the eight-year-old went, oh, grilled onions are gross. And then the other, 10-year-old said, well, I'm going to get mushrooms. And the eight-year-old said, oh, mushrooms are gross. And they were having that kind of a conversation, which is so typical of kids that age, when suddenly the three-year-old said, Anna, and she said, yes, Adriana, said, what do I want on my hamburger? And it got very quiet in the car. And she thought, isn't that something that a three-year-old would just trust that the adult would know what they want. And she said, you know, it was a little bit like being in paradise. This child was just one with everything and one with the adult and just with this confidence that Anna would know. And so the car got very quiet. And then she turned to her daughter who was the 11 year old and said, you know, I haven't heard you say anything and what do you want on your hamburger? And the 11 year old said, well, what makes you think I want a hamburger? And she said that in that moment, there was this span from the most innocent child to the 11 year old who really is thinking for themselves. And that's where we go as class teachers in the Waldorf grade school. We start with this young child and if when you teach first grade, their wide-eyed openness is, is so heartwarming. I always feel that the first graders, they just lean toward you in sympathy. It's a wonderful experience to teach the first graders. They, when you tell them a story, their eyes just are wide open, their mouths are open, they lean on their desk, they're all sympathy. They want to participate and they do it fully. You know, that's the young child. At the other end of the spectrum, they had 11 year old, which is finishing fifth grade and going into middle school. They're not in paradise anymore. They're in a different place. And so these different phases of childhood all in those eight years, they have different needs the children in those ages and those different needs determine, meeting those needs determines their health. And so when the young child comes to school, their, their eagerness is something that the teachers, that the teachers are grateful for. First graders, you know, by and large, they want to please their teachers. They want to do what others do. They want to know how to do the things they see their parents do. They know their parents can write. They know their parents can read. They know their parents can work with numbers. And those are things that quietly in them, they want to learn. They have older brothers and sisters and they see what their siblings do. So they come with these unspoken longings and they bring a willingness and eagerness. And this is what the teacher wants to tap into. And in doing that with the young child, we want to help them learn how to work 
at school. And we want them to be able to participate in the learning experience in a way that begins to build the kind of habits that are gonna enable them to succeed in school. And I say it like that, but it's in how we do it that really brings the health. Now, I want to tell you um, a little story that I ran into working with fathers, because I, I got to do that a fair amount over my time working at the Nova Institute. And I always loved working with the dads. And in rare moments, the dads will say things that are just absolutely surprising. And in one session that I was in, one of the dads said, look, tell me this. Tell me how the kindergarten teacher does this. I see the kids in the class I was visiting last week and they were playing and there were things all over the room and the teacher started singing and the children immediately began to clean up. How did she do that? And I thought that's an amazing question because it's, it's a first grade question also. It's how do we build the ritual that makes it easy for children to do the things they need to do in school? Because that kindergarten teacher went into the beginning of the year knowing that cleanup time is such an important moment in the preschool classroom. And that this preschool teacher held the intention that they were going to build in a ritual of asking the children to clean up at the same time just about the same time every day. And at that moment, the preschool teacher would know that the optimal word pronoun was we. We are going to clean up now. And she would begin by singing and joining the children so that her participation was showing them exactly what they were to do, how the toys went back into the basket how you put them in carefully, how they went back on the shelves. And while she was doing that, she was looking to see which children had not yet involved themselves fully. So she would stand up and go and bring that child gently by the hand and have them know that they're wanted to in this participation. Not corrected, but just invited. And then the children would do this. And while she did it, they, she sang. And that was day one. And then the next day, she did the same thing. And it was this teacher's intention, which was repeated every day with the children until a month or six weeks later, the children were just accustomed to this moment in the day, in their routine. Children love patterns. And as they get to see there's a pattern in their experience, it reassures them. It gives them a sense of order. It gives them a sense of safety. And that's how a grade school teacher works. We call it rhythm in the Waldorf School. It's the gentle repetition of activities, but all activities. So how we stand up in the morning and say our poem and our verse and sing the songs that we sing and how that repetition of that makes the children feel, this is what we do. It takes a while in first grade because everything is so new, but little by little, they become accustomed and then they become accustomed to working in their main lesson books. And as they do this, the same each day. And keeping in mind that one of the things that's so important in the early grades of teaching is this sense of timelessness. I once had someone tell me, you know, there are no clocks in first grade. And that really helped me because when you take your time and you feel you've got all the time in the world, everything settles into a very peaceful routine. 
There's no rush. There's no tension. There's a spaciousness. So we open our books and we have time to make sure that the books are right side up. It's very easy for a first grader to have their book upside down and right in backwards. And so we make sure our books are right side up. And then we make sure our crayons are open on the desk and that all the crayons are there. For a first grader, keeping all the crayons in their crayon case, that's a job. But what an important lesson to know that we take care of our tools. That's important. And that the work we do matters. And little by little, we build a culture in a classroom where we work carefully. And when you have a group of children who work carefully, that becomes a climate that's contagious. It becomes an understanding of this is what we do in our class. This is how we work. It becomes the norm as children work together, working together. And as that happens, what a teacher wants to do is to help the children understand when it's right to say, I'm done. I'm done with my work. Because often there are children who say, I'm finished. And it's not. So how do we gently help the children see what a finished job is? We start that in first grade. We don't do it with a, a strictness, but with this sense that when you're a class teacher, you've got time, time to help the children see what their work can look like when, they're work, when they work carefully and take their time. And as parents, we're always so heartened when our children work carefully and take their time. And as a teacher, I'm delighted when a child loses their sense of time because they're so completely involved in what they're doing. That's the beauty of childhood, that when a child gives themselves fully to an undertaking, it's they, they don't know. And at the end of the day, sometimes they're finishing a picture and you'll ask them to stand up and they'll say, is it lunch? And it's three o'clock because they've been so immersed in what they're doing. Now, the other thing that really is an important part of bringing health to the young child in first grade and second grade is helping them feel part of their class. I was always struck by this because our first grades were formed by two different kindergartens in our school and then another kindergarten, Waldorf kindergarten in another area. And so you had children from four classes and in each of those groups that came from those classes, they knew each other, but then the whole class uh, was just getting to know each other in first grade. And so over time, you get to form your first grade class. And I've always been convinced that my work is to help form that class. And if you ask me what I think when I do that, I would tell you that my job is to form a conspiracy in my classroom. And by that, I mean the original meaning of the word conspiracy which is to breathe together. Because in the grade school, the children breathe together. And that forms a unity, a wholeness. It's a wonderful feeling. So every time they play recorder and they play those notes and there are rests, they breathe together. Every time there's a poem and there is a pause between the stanzas, they breathe together. Every time they laugh in a story, that outbreathing is together. Every time a story that's sad makes them sigh, they breathe together. And that breathing together unites them. And truthfully, I believe that in the early grades, 
the children, well, probably in all the grades, the children are as fond of their friends as they're ever gonna be in life. Their hearts just open with affection for their friends. It's a wonderful thing. And it's part of that breathing together when you feel like there's a tremendous connection and you're gonna spend years together and there's meaning in the forming of those classes that those children will find themselves together. I know that when my sons got married, their wedding party had individuals in it, and especially there, the people who were there uh, in their immediate wedding party, who were in their grade school class, lifelong friends. And that really is how it is when we have those children stay together, create this learning community. So this work with forming the habits in children, the breathing, you know, that one of the things that I guess bears worth is worth saying is that when you work on habits, you can imagine that as a restrictive thing. And yet when I watch Waldorf teachers, they do it gently because habit formation, when it comes through a gentle repetition, it has a lightness that we want. You know, when you do things again and again and again and again, um, we ground them. We ground the practice. We come to know it. We, we know where we stand with this. But that means there's a, there's a heaviness with grounding. And so there needs to be a buoyancy to balance that 11. And that comes through the song and the laughter and the humor. And that's a teacher's job is to look for those lighter moments which balance the more serious moments in a class because there's so much that has to be done in that way. And as Rudolf Steiner always said, no, our teaching is about breathing. How do we teach our children to breathe in our classes, to breathe in and to take in what we give them and then to breathe out with, with joy and enthusiasm and expressiveness. So in the early grades, we're going to work with that as a, as a healing, uh, health-giving, experience for our children. Now, I want to then begin to think of children as they um, get a little older. And as we go into third grade and fourth grade and, and even fifth grade, when we go into the times where the children said, oh, gross, that's when the children go through something that we call the nine-year change. And what happens in the nine-year change is that our children um, get a better sense of who they are. And that sense of self, which is exactly what we want, it comes with um, just different aspects and they're not all um, easy. Like one of the things that'll happen when children go through this nine year change is that they become a little less, um, a little more self-conscious and a little less um, innocent. They wake up to things in the world. Years ago, I was running a workshop for a public school in, in Washington, DC. And um, I was work speaking with the principal and I said, so we'd like to offer this uh, literacy program for your children. Which grade would you like us to work with? And the principal said, I want you to work with the third and fourth graders. She said, because something happens to the children at that age. And I think that they would need this program. And I think when we watch children, as they go from first grade through the grades, we'll notice that something changes as they begin to wake up to the world. And so now to bring health to the children, it becomes a different matter. In a way, it asks us, to sense the question the children now carry, but don't ask out loud. So do they carry the question, is this world safe? And do they carry the question of, do I have friends? Do they carry the question of, 
Do my parents love me when they correct me? Do they carry the question of, is it safe for me to be in my bed in the dark? They have these questions. And Rudolf Steiner, when he developed the Walter School, he understood this, um, these changes in children. And he urged the teachers to sense the different change in a child with each passing grade. And the way he drew attention to that was through the curriculum. And so he knew that this change, what we call the nine year change, that began to occur, begins to occur in third grade. And so the third grade curriculum shifts. Now, what we understand in Waldorf is that the curriculum can change continually, but it should change in a way that it mirrors the inner life of the child. And so one of the subjects that's taught in third grade is farming. And for the longest time, I didn't quite understand why farming was in the third grade. Then I read a book about the nine year change and the author of that book said that the children at this age, they experience uncertainty. So one of the things he noticed was that there was a child in a class at his school and the mother told the teacher that every time she saw her daughter walk home from school, she got to this one house. And when she got to that house, she ran past it. And it was because she was afraid of that house. Those fears are not uncommon at that age. I know they weren't uncommon for me, um, but children become more fearful and they need to have a sense that, that the world is safe for them. Even when they hear things, we have to reassure them. And I took my class to a farm. We had to go and pick apples for a festival at our school in the fall. And I took them to this farm and we were standing in the orchard with our, ba our, our uh, bushel baskets and ready to pick apples. And I was standing next to this boy in my class and he was looking down the aisle, the rows of these apple trees. And on the left, there were just rows and one tree after another filled with apples and they were all um, empire apples. And then to the right, there were all these delicious apples. And you could see him just trying to figure out how many apples there were. And it was more than he could count. And he was good at math. And you got the feeling that here was a picture of the earth's abundance. That our earth, with its wonderful productivity, brings forth so much fruit, so much food. We also went that same year as a class when we studied farming and we helped to harvest sweet potatoes. And we followed the potato digger down the aisle as it unearthed the potatoes and the children all had drywall buckets and they filled those buckets with sweet potatoes and we had a big class. So there were 30 buckets on the side filled. And if you looked at that row where the potato digger had gone down, you couldn't tell that sweet potatoes had been taken out. There were so many. And that feeling of abundance that reassures a child when their world isn't as certain as it was, and that gives them health. At this age, the children want to know what they can depend on. They study house building. And when they study house building, they often get to do a building project. But when you set strong pieces of wood into the earth, when you dig those holes with a post hole digger and the children, and third graders are wonderful because they're enthusiastic still, but they're capable. And together, a class, they can dig those holes. They can set the posts in. They can mix the concrete that, that fixes those posts or put in the gravel to hold them in place. And then 
when you put on those first boards and then you put the joist holders in and the children can see how sturdy they are, how true they are, how they're perpendicular, how those boards are coming together at a right angle, how they're bolted together, how when you put those lag bolts in, how you can feel the wood draw in, they get a sense that you can depend on this. They're building their house, their body, it's changing. And the study of house building can be reassuring to them. And that's, that's what we want is we want the curriculum to be reassuring to the children when something comes to unsettle them. And so these subjects that are there, particularly the stories, they have all of these lessons for children. And I love that we get to tell mythology to children. We get to tell them these age old stories. And I believe they're wise. The Norse stories, the stories from the Hebrew Bible, the Greek myths, the ancient Indian epics, the stories from ancient Egypt and Persia, they all have these wonderful lessons. It's always been the tradition in our world that children are taught the important lessons through stories. That's how the people of our world have done this. The Aborigine, the Native Americans, the Africans, they've all used the story to teach children. And I love that we do that at the Waldorf School because for the child at this age, those stories are both captivating and reassuring because they bring a sense that there is meaning in the world. And that's an important part of what a Waldorf curriculum is trying to convey. That our world, which can at times seem chaotic and random, is really based in beauty and meaning. And we have to look for that because it's not shown to us in our, our culture today, but it is shown in, in our schools. So when our children study the animal kingdom, they get to see the beauty and the intricacy of these animals. When they study the plant kingdom, it's the same in the geology uh, which they study. All of these subjects help them to know the world. And, you know, often we are very um, focused on the lessons we bring our children that prepare them academically. And as a teacher, I was always very attentive to that. I wanted my children to be able to write well. I wanted them to be able to do arithmetic accurately. I wanted them to have good work habits. I wanted them to have certain uh, understandings that they learned in school. I wanted them to, to get what they should get out of school. But I knew that there should be more lessons than that. And that those other lessons should be about life. Our children, should be learning about life as well. And there are life lessons that should come through our teaching. I, re I remember teaching a third grade lesson and it was on grammar. And I was teaching the children about verbs, but in third grade, we don't call them verbs, we call them doing words. And I wanted to ask the children to help me make a list of all the things that they can do. Because one of the things that makes us human is our ability to do so many things because our hands are so unique. We can hold a paintbrush, we can, we can write, we can play an instrument, we can knit, we can weave. And I wanted to ask the children, what can you do? And so they started giving me things that they could do and I put them on the board. I had a completely cleared blackboard. And um, because I want, was hoping for lots of, of words, lots of doing words, verbs. And they said, you know, I can, I can run. I can sing. I can paint. 
I can draw, I can dance, I can, I can sew. And then one of the children said, I can kick. And just by the tone of her voice, we knew she didn't mean a ball. And I thought, what am I gonna do? I put kick on the board. And then we went on and there was another long list of things that children could do. And then another child raised their hand and said, spit, I can spit. <laughs> so I put that up on the board and we went on. And then we had another 10 words of things we can do. I can cook, I can eat, I can saw. Then someone said, punch, I can punch. And at the end of the lesson, we had 75 words up on the board. And one of the girls in the class said, Mr. Petrus, look, how is it that we have all of those words up there? And some of them, most of them, are words about things that we do that are good. And then there are other words like punch and spit and kick that are up there too. And at that moment, for me, it was like this epiphany because that was a picture of human freedom. And that's where the nine-year-old is. You know, they know the difference between good and evil. They know that. And at that moment, they could see that in our lives, we have a choice with what we're going to do. Are we going to do things that make the world happier? Or are we going to do things that make the world sadder? That's a lifelong choice. That's a life question. You hope that when those questions come up in a classroom, because the children ask them, you can't, you can't put them in your lesson plan. They come out of the relationship between students and each other and with the teacher. Those moments are magical and they're important, but they're not in the core curriculum. They can't be because they come out of living moments in the classroom. And they happen in classes. And in the Waldorf School, we're always grateful when those moments occur. We want them. We want our students to be able to encounter those kind of questions. We want when we teach them botany and tell them about the jack pine tree and how that tree only sows its seeds in the intense heat of a fire so that they know that somewhere in their lives, if they come upon a crisis where their lives are heated, that seeds of new beginnings can come. Our children will have those difficult moments. We want them to be resilient. But when you have a picture, what should I say, a parable, in nature that reminds us that in intense moments, new seeds are sown. That can help us because it gives meaning to events that are hard. We want that for our children. I know I do. Now, one of the things that, that I noticed is that taking children, even just as parents, from when they're born to um, when we send them off to college, it's like traveling across country. And the thing that struck me was years ago, I was gonna take a drive across the country and a friend of my father said to me, he said, well, wait, wait when you drive west, wait till you cross the Missouri River everything changes and that excited me and when i got to the missouri river in south dakota i saw that that was true how the land started to roll how it took you to the badlands and the black hills and and how the country became so interesting and dramatic well i think childhood has its missouri river and it's this change third, fourth grade. And when our children change at that point, 
they don't go back. They're becoming more individualized. They're becoming more themselves. And when that happens, then their choices are made out of who they are. And so one of the things that happens in a classroom is that children begin to learn that if I finish my work quickly, I get more recess. And so it becomes a teacher's job to help them still understand what it means to do a job well, which means that the teacher has to notice when a student closes their book and tries to put it in their desk and say, you know, come, come show me your work. Because we have to keep a certain standard, but we have to do it with affection. And we have to do it with reassurance and clarity. We have not changed what we expect. We really are hoping for your best. And I know you can do better than that. It's not a matter of being picky. It's a matter of really supporting children. And I know that there are some children that in at certain ages, I had to say to them, look, that's not what I asked you to do. You're gonna have to do it again. Oh, I can't believe you're asking me to do it. That's okay. We'll stay at lunch. They pay me to be here at lunch. I don't mind helping you. And as long as they know you're not upset with them, you're just helping them, but you're consequent. And children need that. Some children need it more than others. I know I always had children in my class that I, I considered horseshoe players. Because, you know, in horseshoes, if you're close, you get a point. And I had students who thought, I'm close. I mean, E-A, A-E, what's the difference? How do you spell where? Does it matter? Yes. Spell it like this. And, uh, you know, nine times seven. Is that 63, 64? This is, you know, why are you so picky? It matters. And you just tell them gently, you have to do it again. It's okay. I'll sit with you. I like you. We need to do that with our children. It takes a lot of work for a teacher to help children do their best. I know when my eighth graders graduated in my last class, the thing I said to them was something I'd said to them for eight years. So remember, when you think you're done, you're only half done. And to me, that was a mantra I wanted to repeat with drawings, with math work, because half done is, have you really checked your work? With compositions, because half done has, have you reread what you've done? Have you rewritten what you've done? And that was important. And, but the truth is that you can't ask children to have that standard if you don't ask it of yourself. So I was happy to do the extra work for them. And I was always happy to see them really finish a job well. Now, I want to speak about the middle school student. And because that's that 11 year old who asks, what makes you think I want a hamburger. The 11 year old is beginning to think for themselves. And critical thinking really begins um, to show itself in a classroom in sixth grade and, and it grows in seventh grade and eighth grade. And the middle school students, they are charming, they're problematic, they're delightful, they're perplexing, and they're alive. They're just great. But they ask something of us. And I have to tell you the truth, and as a teacher, you know, I took four classes, but I, I won't tell you that I understood middle school students the first time I taught eighth, first to eighth. I didn't understand the second time I taught first to eighth. By the third time I taught first to eighth, I started to get it. My last class, I thought, I understand them. And here's what I came to understand. I, I like in middle school, um, to a journey down the Mississippi River. And forgive me for this simple geographical analogy, but on the Mississippi River, you start in the north, Minnesota, and the water's cool, clear, fresh, fresh water. And that fresh water comes down the Mississippi. It's joined by the Missouri. It's joined by the Ohio. You're getting all this fresh water coming down, and it heads south toward New Orleans, and somewhere, somewhere down 
toward the south. It starts to change. The water from the Gulf, which is salt water, starts to move up the Mississippi and the water becomes brackish. And that Gulf of Mexico, to me, that's the next phase of childhood. And that's that what's coming um, with puberty. And it's got a whole bunch of different needs. And so middle school is brackish. So you still have the needs of the young student who needs a certain um, predictable program. And they need the constancy of a teacher who knows them. And they need um, assignments that are um, easy to understand. But they also have the needs of an older student. And the thing about the older student is that they don't like predictable. <laughs> they think it's boring. They don't like necessarily the same teacher they've always had, even though that teacher really knows them. So they, they like having a lot of other teachers. They like having choices. And so you have this blending of brackish water with fresh water. And at middle school is, is that time. And I've had to ask myself, what is it that the middle school student really longs for? And I believe they long to be challenged. And that it's our assignment to challenge these students, but to do it in the right way. And in a Walder school, what I mean by the right way is to do it in a broad way. So to challenge them academically, for sure, but also to challenge them with their music. Singing in the middle school is incredibly important to those students. When a music teacher can get them to sing together, they're happy. And when they sing in harmony, they're delighted. Young people in middle school love to sing in harmony. Music, I think, is more important to them than visual arts in middle school, even though the visual arts are important. They love to sing. The art should be challenging. I think that with young people, it's really important for them to encounter moments when they're given an assignment and they think, I can't possibly do that. One of those assignments, it comes in seventh grade when the students do their Renaissance reproductions. And they're asked to copy a piece of Renaissance art. And they think, I can't possibly do that. But with a good teacher, they can make that assignment manageable. And that's what teachers do. They make big assignments manageable. And it's not just in grade school that that happens. That happens in high school and it happens in college. You have a, a final thesis that's 40 pages long or 60 pages long. Your professor is going to help you move that into manageable parts through your outline and your research. So good teachers do that. And when students have the sense of doing something they didn't think they could do and seeing it come out good, that's a real growth moment. We want those moments for our kids. We want them to be challenged. We want them to be challenged in a variety of ways. Now, I'm going to ask Caleb if he'd be kind enough to show us um, two of the drawings from the students in my eighth grade when we studied anatomy. One is just a simple skeleton. And this is... Uh, their introductory assignment for anatomy. And they're going to begin their study of the human skeleton. And you can see that the students, their drawing is pretty accurate. You look at those le the lower leg bones, they're really well done. And um, you've got the tibia and the fibia, and you've got the pelvis there and the rib cage and the clavicle and the arms. And you can see they, they did a good job. And this is in the beginning. Now, the next picture is of the vertebrae. And you can see as the children get accustomed to working with this, 
Let's see if we can do that. Caleb, can you, there, there's the vertebrae. Look at that. I, I was so impressed with the student's work, but it's not just the drawing and the shading, but look at the lettering. It's the whole package. Now, you know how long an assignment like that takes a student. But what I like about it is that middle school students, when they draw like this, they muse. They really just live into the shape of our spinal cord, how it varies in size from the upper spinal cord to the lower. They really live into that. And I, I just think that we can ask that of them because it's not artistic ability. It is with the shading, but the accuracy of drawing what you see, that can be developed in the students. It gets developed over time, but it's the care that was there from the very beginning. Whether a teacher takes the children from first to eighth or from first to fifth and from sixth to eighth, it's the whole school program that asks the children to give their best and then holds them to that. Because any adolescent that is going to resist, you just have to find a way to let them know you can do this. I went to uh, watch my son play baseball in college. They played terribly this day. They lost a doubleheader. It was a rainy day. They lost at home. I said to him, I said, what did your coach say after that? I wanted to know what you say to a team. And he said, the coach said, you're better than that. And I thought, that's what I want to say to my kids when, they, when their work doesn't meet the standard. You're better than that. Come on. I know you can do better. Let's work on that. Let's sit together. And, and again, it's that same we that was there in the beginning. Let's just do it. Now, you see these history pictures. Now, this is Queen Elizabeth, not our modern Queen Elizabeth, I don't, but the Queen Elizabeth, um, who was around at the time of the um, Sir Walter Raleigh and the early colonization. And you can see the students can just look at a portrait, they can do it. They can do a face. I know that we had someone come in and just help them work on faces because faces are hard just with the proportions. But once they get it, they really move forward. And then there's one more picture. It's a map from our history study. Let's see if we can maybe can turn that right side up, but I don't know if we can. But in any case, you can see that this is a map of the passage to Jamestown. And you can see how the, the boat follows the trade winds across the lower Atlantic into the Caribbean and then up to Virginia. And you can see how carefully this map is made. But again, it's the whole package. It's the lettering. It's the shape of the continents. It's the taking the time to make the little dots. It's so much is about taking the time, taking the time to label. And so I believe that this was part of what I wanted my students to understand, that we were gonna ask for their best in music, in art, in science, in math, and what we were gonna to get to was helping them think. Caleb, thank you, we can, we can take those away now, thank you. And um, here, here's what I wanted to help our children understand. And we had a, a speaker because we had a high school at our school and at a high school graduation, one of the, um, the people who spoke was a parent of a, of a student in the high school class, the senior class. And she had transferred her son to our school in junior year. And she told this story. She said that her son came to her about, oh, six weeks into the high school program. And he says, mom, I don't know how much you're paying for the Waldorf school. And our, our school's fairly expensive. It's not a public charter, unfortunately. And, and she said, why, what do you wanna know? He said, well, cause whatever you're paying, I think you're wasting your money. And she said, really? 
Why? He said, well, you know what we've been doing? We've been studying Hamlet. And you know what the teacher asked me? No, she said, what? He, said, he asked me, what do you think? And the mother said, well, oh no, maybe that was just your English teacher. No, mom, they're all like that. They all want to know what I think. Now that really struck me. This boy transferred from a very uh, well-respected prep school in Washington, DC. At that school, I'm sure the way they taught was that they wrote on the blackboard, Hamlet, studying Hamlet, written by Shakespeare, about Denmark, took place at this time, the main characters are, the main tensions are. And then the students wrote that all down in their notes. And those notes with additional notes from the other days became the information that was called forth on a test. And they, if you studied well and you took good notes, you got an A, but you didn't think for yourself. And that's what college professors complain about continually, that the students in their classes only wanna know, what do I need to do to get an A? And that they don't find original thinking and they don't find reflection. Recently, I got an email from one of my students from my last class. He's a sophomore at Georgetown University. And he said to me, I'm writing a paper on education for my philosophy teacher. And I wanna know how was it that at the Walder School, we had discussions that were so good? What, what is it in the Walder philosophy that gives rise to those conversations? And I believe it's the understanding that in middle school, the students are beginning to think. The sixth graders, just a little, because they're a little brackish. And so we ask for precision in those geometric jarrings and those science experiments. More so in the seventh graders, they're more brackish. And the eighth graders are very brackish. And that's seventh and eighth grade. We should be asking our students at the right moment, what do you think? and express what you think in writing and express what you think verbally. Because when we do that, it helps us in the process of learning to think for ourselves. That's our job as teachers to help our students learn to think for themselves. So in seventh and eighth grade, when they write papers, write compositions, we asked them to explore topics from two points of view or three. I remember asking my students when we studied the Civil War, please write me a newspaper article as it would appear in Boston the day that they got the news that there was uh, Southern troops fired on Fort Sumter. And so they wrote that. And then the next day I said, please write me a composition from a Charleston paper reporting on the firing on Fort Sumter. Because you want the students to be able in their mind to imagine the various positions that can be taken. One of the things that I asked the students uh, once was at, at our school, I, I always ask the eighth graders what kind of a high school they wanna go to. It's the kind of question that would be important at, school like yours that goes up to eighth grade. And, um, and so I asked the students in a class once, it wasn't my class, it was a different class that I was uh, working in. And they said, well, I want, we want to go to a good school. And I said, so what's a good school like? And they said, well, a good school has a good gym. And that's a very um, normal answer for a middle school student there. They're conventional. They want a good gym and they want a good team and they, they want to cheer and they want to play. I said, well, what else? They said, well, good schools have good science labs. And I thought that's absolutely true. You want to have a good science lab um, so that you can do good and good science equipment and, and have good demonstrations. That's interesting. What else? And they said, good school has good teachers. And I promised myself I wouldn't be offended by that statement. So I said, yeah, that's true. And then they finished and I said, but you forgot something. And they said, what? I said, well, well good schools have good students. 
And that makes me think, what do I mean when I say a good student? What do I have in mind? Because I'm trying to make my students good students. That's my job. I have them for eight years. That's my main assignment, help them become good students. And what I felt was that good students pay attention. They listen when their teachers speak. They listen when their classmates speak. It's hard to teach children to listen today. Uh, it takes years. It's not hard to get children to speak, but it's hard to get them to listen. And if you can cultivate a classroom where students listen to each other, it is such a gift. And Waldorf school teachers work on this. You know, middle school students are much more interested in what their friends have to say. Frankly, I felt they were more interested in what I had to say. They always wanted to learn and they paid reasonable attention. But when their friends spoke, there was a different silence. They were keenly interested. And so when we had discussions in our class, those eighth graders and seventh graders, they said things and I was profoundly grateful to just take part and observe their conversations. Probably the most poignant for me was when we studied American history in eighth grade and we were studying World War II and we had to study the bombing of Hiroshima. And what I did was I, I showed the students a video that day. It was a video of three um, Japanese adults who were in Hiroshima the morning of the bombing. One man was a doctor now, but back then he was a young boy playing hide and seek in his school. And when the bomb war went off, he had his hands over his eyes because he was counting the way we do at hide and seek and not looking. But when the bomb went off, he could see the bones in his fingers, like an x-ray. He was telling that story. Another was a girl who was out with her class and she was sweeping the steps of their school. And she was standing behind a large monolith of metal that was decorative in the front of the school when the bomb went off and all her classmates were sitting on the steps. And after the bomb went off, her classmates were gone. There were only dark stains on the steps. And when the students in my class saw that, they understood the bombing of Hiroshima from a different perspective. But what made it so poignant was that in our class was a young Japanese student who joined our class in sixth grade and the kids in the class loved him. He was just a gentleman, he was kind, he was patient, he was friendly, he was funny. They loved him. And so this whole understanding of the bombing of Hiroshima took on a different perspective for them on a human level. And so they expressed their sadness that this had happened. And then he said, and this was the moment, he said, you know, my country, we're not proud of what we did in World War II. And at that moment, I just thought this was the kind of interchange that should happen in our world out of concern for each other. It was a moment where when you ask, what do you think? The kids just rise up and they say so much more than you ever expected. And that's part of what we want to do in the middle school. But to do that, you have to cultivate a culture in which children listen to each other, respect each other, and are accustomed to saying what they think. What do you think? I just feel it's such a gift with students to be able to do that. And you can see how health-giving it is in 
that young man at Georgetown University, that was his takeaway from his time at Waldorf, just how much he enjoyed those conversations. Thoughtful young man, thoughtful conversation. So on that note, I should pause because we've been going for about an hour and um, so that I don't overdo my welcome here and see if you have any questions. But it's been nice speaking to you about these three different parts of the grade school program and what they need for really a healthy education. Thank you. Thank you. So for those of you who are participating and uh, there are about 45 guests with us at the moment, um, if you type something into the chat, I will attempt to um, summarize it, rephrase it, or read it word for word, depending on how long it is, um, for Jack to ask. And I do have the first one already, but take a moment if you'd like to uh, put something in. So yeah, this this is a good question about the the journey. You know, drawing on your perspective of having taken four classes, you know, advice to parents who have uh, the following reservation about embarking on this journey, um, which is just the 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 level of commitment that it takes, uh, and the trepidation of the potential of it not working or not being a good fit for the child, and the potential that a change might have to be made, um, maybe switching to a conventional public school if things don't work out. And um, what, uh, what advice do you have for parents about, you know, reservations they have for diving into that commitment? That's a good question. And, and truthfully, it's one that I've heard a number of times. And, you know, um, we want to, to do right by our children, we just do. And we want to put them in an educational setting where we have confidence that they're gonna be well served. What I've found is that for parents, the moment that I felt, and here's, here's what I would say, my last class, um, what I noticed was that um, it took me a long time to win the parents' trust, much longer than in any of my other classes. Um, I don't think that we give that trust um, so readily. Um, we're not naive um, as parents. Um, and, and so we're, we're, there's a certain wariness, and I think that that's normal. But what I noticed was that when the parents sit down to talk with the teacher at parent conferences about their children, when the parents get the feeling that that teacher knows my child, that's when we feel better. And so it's those moments that we look to speak with the teacher about the child at the parent conferences and to listen to see, because often the insights no, what I should say that often when we sense that someone understands our child, we feel they're well-placed. And there are many teachers who work with the children, so it's important to speak to all of them. Um, so you get a sense because this collection of teachers, when they see the child, they, they see that child from different perspectives. So in a faculty meeting, when they talk about the children, you often will find that one teacher has something that they see that other teachers don't. And that helps to create the whole picture. If a child, now in, back to your question of well, when, what do we do if our child has to change schools? I think the only thing that I would ask is the, is the when. If you're putting your child in a Waldorf school for one year, I don't know that I would say if it's only one year that it's a, a good thing. Um, I don't know because um, you know, the Waldorf school is going to teach them so many things in first grade, but because of the breadth of the program, you're not going to get the same um, focus that you would get 
in a traditional school. I, I think the breadth of the program program is is very valuable. You know, um, I've heard children who say, "Well, you know, I'm not, I I can't read as well as my neighbor," and then someone will remind them, "Well, you know, but you play the flute, and you can knit, and you can sing, and you know, and you can paint." and and I think that breadth makes for healthy children. And what we find is that our children will catch up and excel. I believe that we should all be asking our children to read. I think we're in danger of becoming an illiterate society, especially with the prevalence of screens. I, I value reading. Now, I know my web designer says I'm a paper-based life form. I like <laughs> hold my books and, and I like to read, but I feel there's value in there for children. There's an inwardness that comes with reading. I don't want to see that go away. Um, often when people ask about the reading program at the Waldorf School, I, I will say to them, I said, you know, you all go downtown to Washington DC, just the same in Sacramento, you, you see the cranes everywhere. And the thing we know about the cranes is that they're usually standing over a large excavated space. And what we know is that for a long period of time, you're not going to see a lot over the come up above the surface of the ground because the work is going on below the surface. But what we know is that the deeper that excavation, the bigger the building is going to be. I think our reading program in a Waldorf school is like that. We are developing a foundation of literacy, deep foundation through storytelling and poetry and the way we teach the letters and a love of language. I have a former student of mine who teaches poetry at UC Davis. And uh, when he was in first grade, he came up to me and he said, do you know what word I love? I love the word champion. His love of language, it was there when he was six years old. He's quite a, a good poet and a good professor. <laughs> um, but it was there, you had that love of language matters. So we're doing a foundation of literacy because we want a strong building. We want our children to read with a feeling and with a vitality and with thoughtfulness. So. I think that um, if you're going to, to embrace the Waldorf program, I think that there's a certain patience and, and a certain hopefulness that the teacher is really going to understand your child because Waldorf offers that. Thank you for that question. Great, I've got, I've got two more already. Um, one is just to kind of ask you to comment on, you know, the journey of being a Waldorf parent and that it's not, you know, an all or nothing um, prospect, but that's it's something that people get closer to and closer to, you know, sort of circling around those ideals, um, you know, and what, what that journey is like as the Waldorf parent sort of slowly takes on the ideals of Waldorf education. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well. Yes, but you know, it's, it's not so different for a teacher because you learn as, as you go. I can't tell you how many times I've said to myself, oh, <laughs> that's what they meant in teacher training. And, you know, this is 20 years later. I'm a slow learner. And as a parent, I'm, I'm also a slow learner. Um, but what I've noticed, and I've had three children go through the Waldorf School from kindergarten through grade 12. And they have qualities that are very interesting to me. Um, they're measured in their thinking. They're, they're moderate. They don't jump to conclusions. They're not judgmental. They know that thinking is a complex process. I love them and about them. They have people skills that are really pronounced. They get people and they both, they're all, they show up in their relationships. Those are the things that, you know, often what you get from a, an education is different than you think it's going to be. Um, you know, for instance, 
um, our children all play musical instruments. They don't play them now. Um, you think, well, what was their takeaway? But their takeaway is in the way they lived. Now, uh, I'll tell you some things a little more uh, autobiographical. Uh, we had a, a dinner the other day. One of our, our sons lives in our area. And um, he had a friend over who went to the Waldorf school with him. And, and his friend was saying, did you ever think that your son was going to be such a great dad? Now, this is a good question because my son, when he was younger, he didn't give any indication that this is where he'd end up. He was a bit of a hellion. He was incredibly challenging and strong-minded and truthfully as a teacher at the school I'd often be embarrassed when I would see him get in trouble. This is my son so I love him dearly and, and unfortunately he's a lot like me and those are always the challenging children but here's my takeaway. What I realized about my son was that he was a cup runneth over person meaning that when he was stubborn, <laughs> he was more stubborn than anybody I met. When he was upset, his cup runneth over. When he did things like play sports, he just did them with complete devotion, his cup runneth over. But as an adult, when he'd call my mother on the phone, he called her more than anybody because his love of family, his cup runneth over. His love of his wife, his love of his son and his daughter, his love of his dog, his love of his brother and sister, his parents, his cup runneth over. That's the unusual thing about parenting. We don't always see the gift that is latent in our children's behavior when they're young, but it's such a gift. And I attribute that to the Waldorf School really nurturing that part of him, his heart. And, uh, and he's the one who always asks about the school and the community and the news. That's a very um, tangential answer to the <laughs> question. I apologize for that. Um, so another question you probably heard before is, um, you know, how to handle a child who is a quick learner and, you know, surpassing through the curriculum that you've planned and how, how do you work with those children in the classroom environment? Yes, yes. Um, well, let's see. There are so many children uh, who are, could be described that way in our classes. And you want them always to know that you understand what they're capable of. I always think of this when I teach arithmetic because I know that even when I'm teaching numbers in first grade, I've got kids in my class who can count to 500. And I've got kids who can do mental arithmetic that's complex. And I want them to know I understand what they can do even while I'm asking them to take part in a lesson that's trying to teach other children in the class. And I believe that's good for them too but I want to give them challenging work. And so I think at least a teacher must always have three lessons in mind. They have the lesson, which is the lesson for the heart of the class, which is your basic um, instruction. And then you have the lesson for the children who might not yet have that same wakefulness when it comes to this learning. They're just coming more slowly. They, their child has gifts, they just some unwrap them later. And then you've got the children who are very advanced in their knowledge and ability. And so you wanna challenge them. But what you know also is that strengths become weaknesses as well. So the child who has this ability so to be keenly intelligent, to be logical, to be sequential in their work with math, to have a good memory, they have a lot of control and that control, that is a, on an emotional level, that's a, 
a limiting factor. So you want to balance that as well. When you work with watercolor paints, that wet on wet paper, you can't control that. That's a good balance. We want wholeness with our children. So we want them to have keen intelligence. We want to work with their gifts, but we want their gifts to be brought to balance. So you have other things as well that you wanna bring them. And you don't force this on children, but over time, you really look to bring that other aspect because you want to teach to wholeness. Uh, the children who are good in math, they often need a little bit of encouragement to work with language. The children who are really good in language need a little bit of encouragement to work with numbers. The children who are blessed with a balanced understanding, you know, those children are, are really well, um, they're set in a good way to start their education. So we look for balance. I think that's really important in education. That's what the Greeks thought. And I think there's had something. So music, math, movement, you know, um, the children who learn quickly, they're very observant. They're keenly observant. But you don't want to just be an observer of life. You really want something where you participate. So there's a, a, a vitality and a and the vigor that we want to bring to children, we want to make them stronger as well. And um, we want to bring balance. So this is, this is a great question of, um, you know, what makes, what makes Waldorf teachers better slash different than other teachers? Um, is it in the training? Is it that we pick good teachers that um, they suggested is the higher salary. I'll probably just say no, <laughs> proud about that one. <laughs> uh, is it, you know, because of just the Waldorf approach and how they work with the school leadership or, um, yeah. yeah, so that's kind of the first part of the question. And the second part is, you know, taking that fact that you've, you've got this sort of better teacher picking and then how do you expand that to a new school? How does the you know, new Waldorf school kind of adapt those abilities to be a more seasoned school? Yeah. Oh, it's, a, it's a great question. I, you know, I've always felt that there are good teachers in all schools. I, I do feel that and, and you read about them and you, you, you see that there are teachers who go do, do good things. I, my sense was always that in a number of schools, the teachers do really good work in spite of the system. I think that's why they're respected and recognized because the, the, the systems of big school systems often um, inhibit really creative teaching and, and they burn teachers out. They disappoint them, they restrict them. Um, I think in a Walder school, the system supports um, the good teaching, uh, in, in a stronger way. And I was a public school teacher in New York City, so I saw good teachers, um, but I, I, I knew that you change principles and, it, and it's different. It's harder to be a good teacher sometimes. Um, what I think you find in Waldorf is you don't find people taking the job for the money and, um, and they take it for idealism. And anybody who enters teaching with idealism, that's a good start. They enter because they love kids and they enter because they feel that teaching children is a way to make the world better. I like that. Um, Waldorf teachers know that, well, I, I said to a friend of mine once who was in training, I said, where did you get a teacher training? He said, you know, when I was a Waldorf teacher training, I felt they opened a door for me and I stepped through it and I could do things I never thought I could do. And there's that aspect. You're gonna be asked to do so many different things. Draw on a blackboard, tell stories, teach different subjects each year, uh, play a musical instrument, take children on nature walks, go camping. It's a really diverse assignment and it asks for your best. And I always think that people are happy when someone asks for their best. And you know, the parents, my experience at the Walter School was the parents were always so appreciative 
of the work I did. And boy, that, that meant a lot to me, um, that people really were happy for the effort I was making. So I think that Waldorf can do that. And then the fact that people enter Waldorf teaching because it means something in their life to do that, that there's a certain destiny. You feel called, you know, and I hear that when I ask people, how did you come to the school? And well, I walked into the building and I just knew I wanted to work there. You know, and when your work becomes a vocation and you feel it's a calling, that's a wonderful feeling. And uh, so I think that's why Waldorf can, can attract good teaching, uh, good teachers. And I, I truly hope it can do that. And when you have a new school and, um, and you get new teachers and you get young teachers, and here's the thing I, I always think about, I think about the kind of teacher I was when I started. I, I think that in some ways, I taught even better in the beginning. <laughs> but when I messed up in the beginning, I messed up bigger. <laughs> well, I taught well, I taught well bigger. Um, I learned to, um, you know, uh, I just kept, became more experienced. I learned not to dig as big a hole, but I don't think I risked as much as, a, as, an, as an experienced teacher. So young teachers have a lot to give in a, in a, in a young school and a young school offers a certain amount of freedom that is special. Um, yes. Thank you. So we do have space for a couple more questions. If you're uh, still with us here, we have about 38 guests. And uh, if you wanna type them in, I'm getting a couple more. And then uh, let's see. Um, so um, this question is around, you know, children who become addicted to screens, you know, especially during the pandemic and not being able to go to school. And um, what thoughts do you have about, you know, the, the adjustment period and what, what children would need coming back into a school environment um, after having had this, um, this year of being online? Yes. Well, well it's an important question. And um, I, I know there are people who are much better suited to answer this than I am because my, I haven't taught online. My, my daughter and my son have um, all year. And I only witness my grandchildren um, who are local and um, who are taught online and um, I'm struck by the difference between my granddaughter who is incredibly conscientious and hates virtual learning and my grandson who is not so conscientious but also hates virtual learning. Their attention spans I think have um, shrunk. And so I think that as teachers, we're gonna to have to grow the ability for kids to pay attention again. And I think their ability to read um, has to be cultivated. And I think their work habits are gonna be cultivated. So really the first year back is gonna be, it's gonna be like one long September for a while. You know, September, you're always struck by what the kids have forgotten over the summer in terms of how you are at school. And uh, they come with enthusiasm, they're eager, but you have to build a stamina. And, uh, and I think that's what it's gonna be like. We're gonna build a stamina. But what I think is important is what we do at home. And, you know, and that question, that's a different answer depending on how old the child is. So I'm just thinking of a 13 and 14 year old and how um, connected they are to their phones. I know that if I were raising my kids again, I would collect their cell phones at night because um, so many kids at that age go to bed with their phones and those phones ring at hours that I know my parents would never have let me answer a call at that hour. 
and they get texts and they have access to all sorts of things. So I think it's parent responsibility also to help wean our kids from the constant connection to virtual learning. Now, whether that means walks in nature, I think walks in nature are important. Whether that means time with pets, I think that's important. Whether it means eating dinner together and just talking, whether it means playing games. I think there's a whole lot of things that we were able to do in the pandemic that we have to keep doing with our families. Because I know the pandemic offered some really good family time. And uh, we want to make sure that stays as well. Thank you, Mary. Time for one more question for our guests and then. Okay, let's see. Just give it a second. Jack, do you want to mention while I'm giving the audience just a second to type something in, um, since you're, you're tied to the written word and the page, um, and you mentioned working with dads, you also have a book on, uh, is it called Protecting Home or? Covering Home. Covering yeah. Home, yeah. You want to mention that title? Well, it, it's a book for dads, and it's about um, lessons on the art of fathering from the game of baseball. <laughs> and I have to say, it was just a, a wonderful treat for me to write that book. Um, I love working with the dads, and they taught me a tremendous amount about parenting and, and about families. And a lot of what I learned from them went into that book. But, uh, yeah. And then uh, I know we mentioned your title, the Understanding Waldorf Education, and then you um, uh, there's another title you have about sort of creating structure and discipline. Navigating the terrain of childhood. It's this idea of taking a trip across country. Okay. And, um, you know, because I, I feel that if we were raising children um, and thinking of it that way, you know, if we were driving cross country, we'd have a map and we would know there are certain parts that are on that we have to pay attention to on the trip across country. We wouldn't just go through the Mojave Desert without knowing that, you know, we had enough coolant in the in car and we had air in the tires and enough gas to get us to the next gas station. But, um, you know, in a similar way, we shouldn't march into the teenage years without having good lines of communication. You know, there's just certain things that we should um, be aware of. And I, and I thought that just to help parents be aware of the nine year change and the and the teenage years and, and what it's gonna offer us as parents because uh, I feel like if we're prepared, we, we, we do better. So that's what that book was about. But um, you know, the, the questions of parenting, there's so many important aspects of parenting and there's so many good books uh, as well. Yeah. Great. Well, I want to thank you for joining us this evening. It's quite a treat to get you just to, to pipe in from the East Coast. Um, and we're, we're really going to look forward to seeing you in person. Um, I don't know if you want to mention in closing things you have planned, if you're far enough along in um, looking ahead to the next year of um, with the Nova Institute or other initiatives or things you have planned over the next 12 months you want to give us a preview of? <laughs> it's not, I know that when um, my wife and I speak, we speak about um, being on the road in October and heading west and yeah. um, hoping to do some work. And, um, and I'm hoping to have a new book out in, in the fall called The Alchemy of Waldorf Teaching. And if that comes out, then I can send copies to, to schools and to oh, see wow. if people would be interested in using them for faculty studies. And... Uh, and hopefully I can bring books in person and hand them to people <laughs> at your school and at the Truckee School and, uh, and um, 
and at the River School, and it would be my pleasure to be out there. But that's as, that's as far as uh, we plan. And, and I think that's part of um, you know, being semi-retired yeah. is, is to have that freedom um, to plan as you go. Wonderful. Well, thanks so much, everyone, for joining us. And as I mentioned in the introduction, we have been recording this evening's presentation with Jack Petrash, and we'll make it available to um, our community, and we'll put out a communication of how to access it. Um, we certainly will advertise if Jack's able to join us in the fall and make sure we get advanced copies of his book and have those available for special signing afterwards. Uh, it's great if you have a former student at UC Davis and other people to see you while you're out here. So, yeah. Nice. Um, wonderful. Well, thanks everyone. I think I'll, uh, it's, it's about 10 to seven here in California. And uh, I see some gestures of applause in the reactions field from our audience. So the people who asked the questions all appreciated their answers and wanted me to let you know, so. Well, Caleb, thank you very much. And thank you all for this evening. It was very nice of you to invite me to, to give this talk. And, uh, and I've enjoyed myself. I hope it was worthwhile for everyone. Thank you, Caleb, for all your help. Yeah. Thank you, Jack. Allah, thank you. Hey, good evening, Golden Valley and guests. <laughs> have, a, have a wonderful summer. And thanks for staying connected with us um, over the summer. <laughs>